Hello. Hey, how's it going? It is going pretty well. I'm feeling a little frenetic right now. Just got home from a church production practice thing and uh boy it was lots of people doing lots of different parts and uh, it's gonna all come together but it's gonna take some extra work so and i i rushed in the door knowing you were gonna call and barely made it in time so here i am how are you doing (laughs) well congratulations on making it you're so so (laughs) <laughs> Your story reminds me, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Have you seen the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged? No. Oh, my word. Just look for some repertory theater in your area that is putting on this production. It's only a four-person crew, and they literally run through every single, well, in some way, they run through every single Shakespearean play With just four actors running around, throwing on a hat to be this character, and then throwing on a beard to be that character. And then it's just mass chaos, and it's so funny. It's a great show. Nice. I'll have to hope that uh, one of my kids puts it on in high school. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. That'd be awesome. It's such a a fun show. Yeah, sounds like it. But uh, how are you doing? Um, I am good. You know, we are recording. It's it's always funny when, to me with these recordings because sometimes we record as though it were live and it's happening on the date. And other days we record and acknowledge the fact that we record these in advance. And mm-hmm. it just, I never know which time zone <laughs> in a way that we're actually in. And I This episode is coming out two days after Christmas, so I really feel like everybody wants to know, how was your Christmas? And the answer is, we don't know. It hasn't happened yet. In faith, we're going to say it was good. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. But knowing that the calendar is about to turn over and looking ahead to the new year, I would love to just talk about visions for next year. I'm intentionally not using the word resolutions. I just don't like New Year's resolutions. But I do, I think there are two times during the year that I tend to think about what comes next. And that is at the turn of the calendar and at the start of fall when everybody goes back to school. Mm. I feel like those are the two moments where I pause and I go, okay, where am I at? Take stock. What am I going to do next? And for whatever reason, like the f- the one in the fall feels like there's less pressure involved. There's more pressure around the New Year's idea. So I'm going to remove the pressure, but I, I would love to talk about what 2023 is going to look like for you That's and me. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, you know, you said take stock and then figure out where things are going to go, what's going to happen in the new year. So when you take stock of your life as it has been recently, how would you describe that? Yeah, as I take stock, I think every person would have this generic statement to make. I'm happy with some things and not so happy with others. The things that I'm happy about, I am nearly finished with my seminary education, and that is phenomenal. I have really enjoyed the education and the growth that it has produced in me. I enjoy who I am becoming. I enjoy the new life goals and direction that it engenders. I love the fact that we started this podcast. That continues to be a highlight for me, and that's something that happened in this last year. I am happy with who my kids are and who they're growing to be. I am happy in my marriage and want to continue to see it flourish amidst a very busy, chaotic life. Those are the general reflections I have. There are things I'd like to improve. There's things about my own character or my own relationship with God I'd like to see do better. There are things I have not yet attained, like I haven't finished my MDiv. 
I haven't finished my master's in counseling. I'm not yet in the career that I am preparing for. There are things that are still in process that I'm eager to see finalized. But yeah, I think that's generally speaking my evaluation. Oh, and reading. I'm super happy. I might, I might break my all time number of books that I've read in a year. I might break that this year in 2022. I'm not going to beat my page count though, but I'm, I might beat my, my number of books. So I'm pretty excited about that. Nice. For those of you who are listening, please guess what that number of books is and what that page count is and list yours. We would love to hear how many pages. This is what Goodreads is for, by the way. Uh, <laughs> right. You know. Which, by the way, they have removed the feature that allows you to do the year in review of the current year. I went on it th today because I always go to year in review, but the present year to keep track of some things. And they took that feature out. So I had to go into the like address bar and change the date <laughs> in the address bar like... You know, the www.goodreads.com slash 2023, you know, so yes, uh, unless awesome. I missed it, it took me to 2021 and there used to be a previous year button and a next year button. Yeah. And they took the next year button off 2021. Oh, that's lame. Yeah, I know. I was very sad about this, but. Well, you can go into the reading stats button and get all that same data. Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, where were we before I got so distracted about Goodreads? <laughs> I was about to flip the question to you and ask you, what's your evaluation of where you stand right now? First of all, I appreciate the fact that you carefully make sure you capture all the various aspects of your life. Because if I think about my life, I'm overall very happy with my relationship with my kids and where my kids are at. I feel like I am in a new stage of parenting in which there is a lot more releasing and trusting the parenting I've already done. Hmm. I am genuinely delighted at being married and, and in my relationship with my wife, though the book Love is a Decision that I think we both read before we got married says that it doesn't really matter what the husband thinks because he's probably wrong. He should just check with his wife on how his marriage is doing. Um, <laughs> it's the only thing I remember from that book, and it has proved to be correct over and over and over again, that one thing. I don't doubt the validity of that, but <laughs> I have to say I'm married to a nine, and when I ask how are we doing – I get a very bland answer because she just wants everything to be happy and everything to be like copacetic and she doesn't want to rock the boat. And so either that means things are fine and there's no boat to rock or she's reluctant to tell me and I never know which it is. So I don't doubt that it's true. I just can't find a way to get at the truth. Hmm. Yeah, you highlight the fact that everybody's circumstances are different. I resonate with it perhaps at least a tad bit because I'm married to a therapist. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, I have appreciated that one line out of that book. It has consistently helped me understand my marriage better. So that's good. I actually feel like I'm getting into a stride uh, with the church. It's been there for a couple of years and it's funny, but I just feel like I'm getting into a stride that's working. So in all the spheres, things are good. But if I look at myself, the words that come to mind are words like anxious and narrow is another word that comes to mind, uh, sort of closed in. When I'm trying to get things done, I focus in and ignore the rest of the world. In doing so, my world shrinks down just to a certain limited set of things. And that is a small, narrow place to be. And when I'm able to relax, 
I find my world growing again as Mm -hmm. my awareness of the world grows. And I find myself appreciative of this the bigness of the world, the wide openness of the world. Does that make any kind of sense? Yeah, it really does. And actually you sharing that reminded me of like two conflicting things that are happening in my own head right now. On the one hand, I was just writing a reflection paper about my training and mentoring experience all through seminary. And one of the prompts for that paper asks, as you continue to look ahead and look at the formation needs that you still have outstanding in your life, what would you like to grow in and how are you going to get there? And I realize my answer is slowing down. I overbook my schedule way too much. I am overextended and it leaves me with no choice but to just be focused on the tasks. All of that is true, while at the same time, I was thinking about this conversation, and I was thinking about the new year, and all I did was note all of the tasks, all of the things that I want to do. And these things are contradictory. I'm still stuck in the, what am I going to do mentality, and not how am I going to slow down? Who am I going to become? Yeah, that's interesting. I I like that phrase, what formation needs do you have? Or however you phrase that. That phrase formation needs is great. Uh, Because even, you know, over the years, one one of the things we've had discussions about in this moment of the year is just, what's your reading plan for next year? Mm hmm. And as I thought about that question, as because that was my starting point as I was looking to, towards this conversation, was what am I going to read next year? And I have a list of books that I'm interested in reading and whatever, but I found myself worried about consumptive reading. Hmm. We are a consumptive culture, right? We just We just want to consume. And the more we consume, the better. As cerebral individuals, at least, let me back up and not point the finger at you, as a cerebral individual, what would be a more natural outgrowth of that cultural value than to think that I am doing great if I read a whole bunch of books? Oh, so I shouldn't have bragged about beating my own record. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was... Halfway through the sentence, and I realized where I was going. And I, to be clear, I am evaluating me. I, yes. And there is nothing wrong with, and I know you're just teasing, but there's nothing wrong with having a goal, and there's nothing wrong with meeting that goal. And there's certainly, I I do not want to suggest that we as Americans are too intellectually refined and need to think less. Clearly, that's not my point. (laughs) Um, But I think I personally am in danger of being a consumptive reader. Every time I'm reading a book, by the time I'm three quarters of the way through the book, if I'm going to finish it, and one of the great influences you have had on my life is that I finish at least some books sometimes, but... If I'm going to finish a book by three quarters of the way through, I'm just thinking about finishing it. I'm not even enjoying it anymore. I'm so focused on just getting to the end. Mm. And if that's not where I want to be right now, where do I want to be? And I found myself asking a similar question. You asked, who do I want to become, I think, is how you phrased it. And I found myself simply asking, who do I want to be? What if I start with that as the question for the new year? Who do I want to be? Yeah, that's so good. I really resonate with what you're saying about being a consumptive reader. That is one of the things that I kind of had as a goal for myself in seminary was 
to not just consume books. I think prior to seminary, my tendency was just as you say, just like slam through the books. I enjoyed the process of learning, but I didn't do a lot of digestion. And so I just consumed, 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 consumed. And what seminary forces you to do, whether you want to or not, is take all of that content and work with it, mold it, play with it, write a paper about it, bounce those ideas off of other authors addressing the topic from a different perspective or from a similar perspective, but not altogether the same, and really working through these ideas. And I appreciate that process. I was just, like literally before we recorded, I was just telling Shelley how much I hate writing, which is weird because I have had to do quite a bit of it in seminary, and I still hate the process. I still fight the process. And every time I write, whether it's a blog post or a paper or something, more often than not, people tell me I'm a good writer. And I feel like something I am supposed to do at some point in my life is to write a book or two. And if I'm going to ever do that, I'm just going to hate the process. But for me, writing is a way of forcing myself to not just consume. I have to like sit and play with the ideas. And of course, talking to you has always been part of that. And I'm thankful for the podcast to be able to do that in a fresh way. But it's not enough for me. Yeah. You know, and I think I was, I think, inspired in part to be asking that question at the beginning of the year because of some of the things you've shared about your rule of life that you've created and you sent me recently. And in reading it and reflecting on it and comparing the way that you developed your rule of life, which really felt to me like guiding principles. Mm as opposed to the way I had years ago developed my rule of life, which was very much in the vein of a chart of habits that I could check off each day, whether I did the things I was supposed to do. I really appreciated the openness and the invitingness of simply listing really who you wanted to be. That's what your rule of life spoke to when I read it. I really found myself invited to ask who I want to be and to begin to sketch some simple descriptors of who I want to be in the new year. So that's really the direction I have been going before getting into specifics, what direction have you found your thoughts kind of going from this who you want to become? What has that kind of fleshed out like for you? Well, yeah, it's interesting. I just described a few moments ago how there are two warring ideologies within me. The one being a focus on who do I want to become but then there's also, you can't just live in the realm of indefinite ideas. You actually have to sit down and do the work necessary to become the person you want to become. And so I have a tendency to boil that down into tasks and to boil it down into, you know, step by step, I want to get this done by this date and this done by this date. And it's funny, I was telling Shelly, so... <laughs> A couple of years ago, I put together a 10-year plan for myself. And one of the things I want to do in life is to continue working with the biblical languages and possibly even teach Greek at like a local high school or a Christian high school or something like that. I think that would be a fantastic thing to do. I just love doing it. I'm teaching Greek to a couple of boys right now, to a couple of high school boys, and I love it. But one of the goals I set myself for myself was to have a certain vocabulary proficiency by the end of this calendar year. And I did not attain that. And so when I look at my 10-year plan, I took many, 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 many steps 
toward becoming the type of person I want to become on a variety of different levels. But I did not hit my vocabulary proficiency that I'd set out for myself as a task. And so now when I think about my 10-year plan, or if I think about my year in review, I have a sense of guilt or shame. I don't even want to open the document because I missed this task, which is completely to ignore all of the other things I did over this last year to work with Greek and with Hebrew and to become a person who is proficient in those languages. So yeah, where am I at with planning the next year? I think I'm warring between this idea of just living with who do I want to become and making sure I'm doing things that fit that and actually creating tangible goals that I can measure and objectively evaluate and then potentially feel guilty for not meeting them. Yeah, I. this makes sense to me. And I am very similar to you. I mean, I just described my rule of life that I made years ago as a checklist of habits. I didn't even have values behind it. I just had habits. Because at the end of the day, let's cut to the chase. That's what mattered. It was a giant spreadsheet, and I checkmarked, and I knew that I needed to get a certain number of check marks per day, and uh, I had habits in every sphere of life, and it fit who I was, and it was very good at the time, but as I look at who I want to become, getting too concrete, getting too goal-oriented, I'm concerned will suck the vitality out of the whole thing. Yeah. You know, I was I was sharing this with Kristen after church on Sunday. Sometimes I love the old meaning of words and the richness that that gives. So like, for example, the word virtue today just means a good thing. <laughs> but it really used to mean a thing's essence almost its life-giving essence, right? I don't want to suck the virtue out of my values. And I'm concerned that turning it into tasks, measurable deliverables may not be a good plan. But then I find myself thinking, so then what do I do with them? Yeah. You know, so if I can get a little bit more specific here, I landed on four things that I want to be in the new year. And it's funny, you already said one of them. Number one is slow down. I want to live slowly. You know, I, I stopped today and looked out my window. And as my mind settled and my heart settled... I realized I could see the clouds moving, but I had to slow down like 60% before I could notice the clouds were moving. <laughs> to me, there's a relational side of that same coin, and it really came to light in the sermon this weekend. There was a question posed in the sermon that was, what if we judged our entire day based on how interruptible we were. Mm. How willing was I to be interrupted by somebody else and give them my full attention, no matter what else is going on? Have I built enough white space into my schedule that that's perfectly acceptable? I, I planned to be interrupted. Yeah. So number one was slow down. Number two, and this is going to get more and more hallmarky as we go, <laughs> to the degree that I find it mildly embarrassing to say these things out loud, but I want to live joyfully. Anybody who knows me will say that I am intentional, focused, purposeful, but I want to shift from purposeful to joyful, from intentional to joyful. Yes, And I'm not saying you can't be both, but if I spend every second of my day focusing on how I need to grow, 
I'm not focusing on enjoying the moment I'm in and being who I am right. and letting this moment be a good thing. Yeah. I feel like we're in like kind of this rhythm right now where you, you say a thing and I tell a story about it and you say a thing and I tell a story about it. So, so do I, you have any stories about that? I, you know what? It's funny. You should ask. I'm reading or listening to rather the Lord of the Rings series. And mm. I, I, Okay, can I, I be super nerdy and ask with which narrator, like the old narrator or the new narrator? Uh, it is Rob the, Inglis or the other guy. Not Rob Inglis. Uh, okay. Sykes, I think his name is pronounced. Um, I, the guy who actually does the voiceover for Gollum in the mm-hmm. movies is the guy who is narrating these books, and he is doing a phenomenal job. Nice. Have you listened to his narration? I haven't. I own all the Rob Inglis ones, and I've listened to them all three or four times. The next time I go through them, it's going to be with the new narrator, but I haven't gotten there yet. So his characterization of Tom Bombadil was an absolute inspiration for living a life of joy. Tom Bombadil mm. is described as a guy whose joy has like literally etched itself into his old face. And he's just happy all the time. And he kind of bebops along. Everything is in a sing-song voice. He is happy and excitable. And he exudes joy all the time. And I was I was really taken with that. And I'm like... Nobody would describe me that way. (laughs) And I would love it if I could grow toward, I could never be Tom Bombadil. That would not be authentic to who I am. But if I could have some joy creases in my old face, that would be good. Yeah. There is a danger in savoring the mission of carrying the ring a little too much and being proud of how not Tom Bombadil we are. Hmm. Yes. And I'm right there with you. I could grow a little in that direction. And I probably wouldn't be out of balance. Absolutely. Well, just to wrap it up, I would love to hear your last two hallmark areas of growth. (laughs) Sure. So number three, and we've kind of already touched on this one a bunch, is just to live lovingly. Hmm. I just want to, I just want to love people. And Ford drills in on that one a little bit. I want to choose acceptance. I want to accept people where they're at rather than just constantly, because if I'm pushing myself to grow, I'm pushing everybody else around me to grow too. Hmm. I just want to accept people where they're at. I want to accept myself where I'm at. I want to not grumble in my head all the time about where people aren't. I don't want to waste emotional energy on having unrealistic and unreasonable expectations. I just want to live in a place where I am genuinely accepting of others from the very core of who I am and free, therefore, to not waste time and energy on wishing things were and people were different. You know, thank you for sharing. You've done so much sharing about your own goals in this episode. I feel like we might have to flip the script at some point so that I can share my rule of life and talk about yes. the ways that I want to grow. Cause I don't want to leave you hanging as being the only guy that, uh, you know, put himself out there. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm happy to have put it out there, but I really would you know, like I said, I a lot of this came from reading your rule of life, and I would love, and and I still have not, even in outside of the podcast, I have not heard your reflections on your rule of life yet, and I am dying to hear that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'm happy to share because it was a it was a fun process. Um, so. But if I can, I'd love to turn to the audience for a moment and say, I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. 
Thank you for joining us here on On the Phone with Josh. We would love to interact with you on Facebook, on Instagram, and we actually put our links to our socials in the show notes. In addition, anytime we reference a book or a podcast or an app that we use or something like that, all of that can always be found in the show notes. If it's a book, there's also a link that will take you straight to Amazon where you can read reviews about the book, maybe even order it if you choose to. So just know that the show notes are a resource for you. And we would love to just interact with you. What is your next year looking like? What do you want to grow into? What are the steps you hope will be a part of that journey for you? And how do you make that into a year long vision rather than something that gets forgotten before the sun even comes out in in the spring? So Come join us on the phone with Josh on Facebook and Instagram. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. But, you know, I I just shared a whole bunch of things about my thoughts for the year and whatever, but I am curious. I just want to hear your thoughts from this last week. What else have you been thinking about? Yeah, so my thought comes from a conversation I had with Dean this week. And here in Oregon, there is bingo. A... Bingo. Yeah. Is because I said Dean's name. Yeah, he's on the bingo sheet. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, if if you don't know what Josh from Missouri just referenced, look us up on Facebook or Instagram and search for the post about bingo. One of our wonderful fans put together an entire bingo card pertaining to our podcast, and it's hilarious. And so, yes, I guess Dean is on the bingo card. So, but anyway, I was having a conversation with Dean. It, do you need to mark it again? Bingo. <laughs> and here in Oregon, there's a law that they call the death with dignity law, and it's uh, physician assisted suicide. And this comes up from time to time with people who are terminally ill and facing a long, hard illness that they know will only end in death. And so in Oregon, they have the legal right to work with a physician to take a little concoction, a a drink that uh, they have to mix themselves. And at whatever point they want to mix it and take it, it will painlessly end their life. And he was reflecting on the fact that he doesn't like the terminology, death with dignity. Obviously, we understand what people are trying to get at with that name, but the unfortunate implication is that any other form of death is not dignified, particularly if you're if you have a long drawn out illness. And it got me thinking about what a dignified death really is. And you and I both have watched a number of musicals over time. I don't know if you've ever seen the musical Rent. I actually haven't. So the subject matter of Rent is pretty risque. So it doesn't necessarily portray great subject matter. But there is a scene where there is an AIDS support group gathered in a community hall in the middle of New York City, and they break out into song in the middle of it with a very kind of depressing, again, minor key, reflection on what dying of AIDS will look like for them. And the refrain, they end up singing it in a chorus, or in a round, rather, and they they say, Will I lose my dignity? Will someone care? Will I wake tomorrow? from this nightmare. And I think that second line actually is the most direct. Will I lose my dignity, but will someone care? And I think it's, as you were talking Mm. about, you wanting to love people more. Loving somebody at the end of life is dignity. Being seen, being known, being cared for. So my wife's aunt died from MS a couple of years ago. And at toward the latter stages of her illness, she couldn't move anything from her neck down. 
And so she had to have other people feed her. She lived in a wheelchair, all of these sorts of things. And so when she would come to family events, somebody had to be tasked with feeding her. And invariably, my wife took that upon herself. And she counted it a privilege. She wanted to do that. And so for her to take the time to dish up exactly what she wanted in the proportions that she wanted, to make sure she got a drink when she wanted it, to make sure she got a bite of whatever she wanted next, the size bite she wanted, and to just sit with her and spend time with her and not make it awkward that she's having to feed another adult. That to me is dignity. That Mm. to me is being seen and loved and cared, cared for. And so I just, we were having this reflection about what death with dignity really implies. And I think dignity is being loved and seen and cared for at the end of life. And this is my wife's passion. And I feel like I'm stealing her thunder by even talking about it because everything I know about the end of life, I know from her. And everything I know, quite frankly, about tangible love that I just described, I know from her. I'm going to say one more thing that my wife would say if she were here, and then I'll I'll turn it over to you. That is, the church doesn't always do a great job of talking about end-of-life care. We talk a lot Mm -hmm. about living for Christ. We talk a lot about being with Christ after we die, but we don't talk about the dying process. And so we don't know how to do this well, and we don't know how to dignify the dying process. And that would be a so often in our thoughts sections, I find myself saying this, but that would be a really interesting conversation topic for us to have at some point. What do people following Jesus need from the church regarding death and dying? Hmm. That would be a fascinating topic to discuss at some point. Yeah. And I, if we were going to have that conversation, I would want to bring Shelly on to, to have that conversation. She, she's yeah. the expert here, and, and she would just be able to really give us some good stuff to chew on. Yeah, I would love that. That would be fascinating. All right. I have taken up quite a bit of time with that thought, so you are up, sir. All right. Well, my thought is from the Psalms. And, you know, we're going to be spending a bunch of time together in the Psalms next year. And I'm super excited about that. But I was reading, I don't remember if it was Psalm 103 or Psalm 104 this week or, or this morning. And it was in that moment when I paused to watch the clouds and to slow down. And the Psalm that I read referred to the clouds as God's chariot. This is a, an image in the Old Testament in a number of different places. But as I actually thought through those words and watched clouds, the imagery really struck me. Because clouds do not move fast. Hmm. Right? Clouds don't zoom by. They just sort of glacially, inexorably roll past. And it spoke to something of what the coming of God was like for the psalmist to choose clouds as the image of the coming of God. That God's coming isn't zippy, it's glacial and inevitable and inexorable Mm. and all the more profound for that. And I guess sometimes we connect fast with definite. And it was a good reminder to me in, in the context of our conversation about slowing down and things like that, that God's coming is Glacial. Hmm. Just another indication that God moves at a much slower speed than we mm-hmm. do. And particularly, I think, in our modern culture that is so instantaneous. Hmm. 
I think we humans have always been impatient, but we have found new ways to be impatient in the last hundred years that were unknown in human history. We have sped up our growth in impatience. Yeah, right. But, but God just doesn't live at that speed. So I guess that brings us to the which Josh question. And which Josh, this is so, this is so us. And so I'm, I'm so glad that we put this out there. Which Josh forces the other Josh to do all of the time zone conversions when they coordinate schedules? And this is definitely me. <laughs> uh, this is definitely me, though it has fallen into a place of routine. I don't know how much forcing I have to do at this point. 20 years later, it just is the way it is. Yes, that's so totally true. When you lived on the East Coast, for some reason, that three hour difference was, and I'm, I'm not just blaming you, like sometimes it was tough math. Uh, and it just, I don't know, kind of baffled the brain a little bit, um, and who's ahead and who's behind. And so I think you threw your hands up at one point and and you were like, I I don't know. I'm done. Yeah. So you know what? All times Josh from Missouri. (laughs) That's, that's what all times are now. Yes, it is true. I have not done a time conversion in this friendship for decades. (laughs) <laughs> uh, it's true for real but well anyway with that in mind are we on for next week we sure are i can't wait awesome well i'll talk to you then okay bye-bye all right bye